Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in this morning for our Shopcrete uh, and its potential applications on Ontario construction projects. We have a very exciting presentation today for you guys. Um, before we get started, as always, um, some housekeeping items. Uh, this will be approximately a 45-minute webinar with 15 minutes uh, left at the end for questions and answers. Uh, all attendees are currently muted and will remain that way for the remainder of the actual webinar. Um, if you do have a question, please use the uh, GoToWebinar questions pane on the right side of your screen and uh, type in your question. We'll address all questions at the end. And uh, this webinar will be recorded and posted on the uh, Concord Ontario YouTube channel, which is uh, accessible via our website, uh, uh, concordontario.org. Um, top right of the screen, there's a little YouTube icon that you can click and you can access all our videos. Uh, your presenter today is Ryan Regeer. He's the contract manager for HCM uh, Shotcrete. Uh, Ryan has a civil engineering degree as well as a graduate degree. Um, he did his graduate degree in eight, uh, SHM reinforced concrete bridges. Um, and Ryan has over five years experience of heavy civil uh, project man management. So Ryan, thank you very much for uh, joining us this morning. And uh, I'll turn it over to you so we can get started. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to give a brief outline of what this webinar is going to go through. Uh, go through the actual definition of Shaw Creek from ACI. A brief history of how this technology was developed going through the two different types of processes, the dry mix and wet mix shock creep process, uh, go through the shock creep specifications uh, briefly on which ones govern this type of work, uh, look at a uh, typical shock creep mix that we use for uh, perimeter foundation walls for condo buildings, uh, and at the end we'll go through a bunch of application and projects outlining the advantage of using shockrete either wet or dry uh, for this project. So first going through the definition, uh, ACI makes the terminology of, for shockrete as a concrete placed by high velocity pneumatic projection from a nozzle. Again, shockrete is not uh, different than concrete, it's just a different method of placing the actual concrete in the field. Going over a brief history, uh, shockrete is not new. It dates back to the 1900s, back when they were using a dry mix setup, uh, more of a gunite type uh, with no aggregate in it, and it was used in blast furnaces um, for steel uh, manufacturers and refineries. Moving on to when the actual shockrete terminology was introduced, uh, back in the 1930s, the American Railway Association introduced shockrete uh, as a terminology. Uh, on the right there, you can see they're using it as slope protection for some of the rail bridges. Um, in the 1940s, they brought in the coarse aggregate into their mix instead of just using cement and sand. And ACI started forming up in late 40s to 50s, uh, bringing to forth the ACI 506 shock read specifications um, and then they brought in steel fibers and silica fume as part of the mixes to optimize the methodology of placing the shock read for applications. In the late 80s for dry mix they brought in pre-bagged uh, materials to make sure that the quality of the actual mix design is there uh, while adding in air trading mixtures for freeze thaw and then the late 90s, early 2000s, the American Shockery Association was formed and the ACI nozzle and certification uh, process was established. And now Shockery is rapidly being used in the construction industry for multiple applications. So going over the two processes, uh, there's both wet mix and dry mix. Um, the wet mix, uh, process is where the water is introduced in a ready mix truck prior to being pumped, whereas the dry mix process, the water is introduced at the nozzle and under both pro processes, the material exits at a high velocity. The velocity decreases as you stream out, so the uh, distance from the receiving surface is very important. You want to be at the proper uh, distance of four to six feet. and with a lower impact velocity, you're reducing the amount of compaction, which 
might cause issues with your final uh, product. More importantly, the consistency of the material uh, and the nozzle angle is important on the placement. I'll touch on this later. Uh, the dry mix shock creep process. So this is a schematic here on the left, left of the process where the material is conveyed through the hose at a high pressure velocity via air and the water is added at the nozzle right uh, before it's placed. Uh, mixing the water and the dry material occurs either in a hydro mix nozzle or a different type of nozzle. Um, actually, if you go to the next slide, there we can talk about it. So this is another schematic of the setup that you're in the field. Uh, there's pre-dampeners that can be applied if you don't use a hydrogen mix nozzle, which reduces the amount of dust uh, and keeps your cement contact in your dry mix material. It's pushed via air through the gun to the nozzle. Water is introduced so you can uh, really modify your mix in the field depending on the conditions and placing it uh, for your project. Here's a schematic of a dry mix nozzle, and the tip definitely helps with the material mixing. Uh, there's multiple types of tips that can be used on the project depending on what conditions you need and what velocity is required. Um, and again, I mentioned the hydro mix nozzle, but it eliminates pre-dampening, um, which can definitely help in the field when you don't have the accessibility of having a pre-dampener and that much space. <clears throat> On to the current wet mix setups. Um, this is where we have a tow behind trailer. Typically, uh, ready mix concrete is, is batched under stringent quality, um, pumped through the line pump to the nozzle uh, and air is added at the nozzle via compressor uh, to put the velocity through the wet mix material to the receiving first surface. Again, another schematic of the wet mix process. You can see the ready mix truck, truck the line pump, air compressor, nozzle and where he's placing it. Again, wet mix nozzles are a little bit different than dry mix nozzles. On the left there, you can see that the two inch line is where the concrete is being pumped from, where the air is being added in the mixing chamber. And on the right, you can see a nozzle with also an accelerator port for a valve if you need to add accelerate the nozzle, typically done for any overhead applications uh, in the field to make sure that you can get the shock feet to stick to the receiving surface. So comparing the two different processes, uh, on the dry mix process, you have the uh, functionality to change and control the consistency of the mix in the field based on the conditions you're seeing. It's better suited for um, areas that are tight on space and they need high early strength properties, similar to rehabbing a bridge. Um, you need to have that high strength if there's any vibration from the <coughs> vehicles uh, passing over top. It can also be transported over longer distances because you're not adding water until the nozzle. Um, so you're not, uh, under a strict timeline of you know two hours or putting it to sleep and accelerating at the nozzle. Uh, additionally, if you have smaller quantities, the start and stop placement are a little bit better. You have a lot less uh, waste and you don't have to pump down your lines. Going to the wet mix process, it's controlled by the ready mix supplier. Um, the good quality and control is there of that mix on site. Your testing occurs, you know, prior uh, putting it into that hopper to make sure you're the right slump and air and such. And that's where you get your insurance from your ready mix uh, supplier. There's less uh, loss due to gunning and via the dust because it is a little bit wetter and there is lower rebound reducing the amount of waste uh, and also it can give you a bit more production because you're not breaking bags over a hopper or using bulk bags. You're bringing in ready mix trucks. <clears throat> so the placement of shockrete should be done by an experienced nozzleman that has ACI uh, certification. Uh, proper placement techniques, you know, require good compaction, so the right amount of air, high velocity, and the receiving surface has to be free of overspray and rebound to make sure you get in good encapsulation of the reinforcing steel. 
Generally, the shooting principles for both wet and dry are this, are similar. Uh, you need to have that impact velocity as well as a proper plasticity of the actual mixing material. And you need to be shooting at 90 degrees of the receiving face to get the proper compaction and minimize rebound. You always want to minimize the amount of waste on a project. Uh, so looking at this as a patch where you want to make sure that you're doing the proper, you always want to make sure you're doing circular motion while uh, placing shot treat. However, you want to make sure that you're filling any voids, holes, or corners first so you don't get any rebound building up there. Uh, and if you do get that, you are not actually getting a, a good shot treat mix. And again, you need a continuous uh, circular motion to build up uniform layers of shot treat. Again, on the placement methodology on the left, you want to keep, it shows you keeping 90 degrees to your receiving surface. You're going to have to move your body around the proper orientation, whereas on the right, you have shooting it at 45 degrees, and you're not going to get the proper compaction or encapsulation of rebar based on that technique. <clears throat> I'm now going to run through a typical setup for a wet mix uh, condo foundation wall. Um, so on the left there, we have our typical setup. We drive on site with our equipment. We have a tow behind pump, a 375 compressor, and a tote with all of our hoses, small tools, um, as well as our scaffolding goes on there. On the right hand side, uh, you can see the setup with the scaffolding and the hose laid out. We're prepped for a shoot. This is a 300 wall with a double mat of 15M rebar on uh, 300 centers, both horizontal and vertical. It's also hoarded because uh, we're shooting this in winter, so we're keeping the proper ambient and substrate temperature. <clears throat> On the left, you can see uh, there's a box out, as well as there's two thin piano wires, which actually lay out the face of your wall. The wall is wired or used with pencil rod to lay out the face of wall. Um, on the right hand side, you can see a curved wall with piano, a uh, pencil rod used to show the final um, wall layout. The shock grid is placed to that wire or pencil rod. So when we're placing the shotcrete, we usually stack from bottom up. You can see on the left hand side, we have a box out for any struts. There'll also be some for breakers. And the rebound is collected on the bottom of the uh, work area. We, you typically have shovelers to clean the work area up and keep the site uh, neat and tidy. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see an example of good uh, consolidated and compacted shawcrete on the bottom. And as we work our way up on the top of that screen, we're getting starting to get the encapsulation of the rebar. <clears throat> Uh, on the left hand side, you can see the finisher cutting the wall with a six foot screed board between the piano wires to make sure that the final layout of the wall is correct. Once it's cut to those piano wires, our finishers come along with a steel trowel or a sponge um, to finish the wall as well. Uh, every 10 to 12 feet, roughly, we do control joints for shrinkage cracking. And you can see on the right hand side there that it's tooled in the uh, final wall. This is a picture of the finished radius wall um, that I showed previously. Uh, again, this is complex geometry with formwork. So this is where shawcrete is definitely a better application uh, depending on the project. So looking into these specifications, um, CSA doesn't have a shawcrete specification. However, shawcrete is just a methodology for placing concrete. So everything within the CSA standards of, uh, do hold true for all of shock replacement. However, there's a detailed guide, uh, ACI 506, with all of the uh, technical details in it, as well as OPSS has a shock read, uh, specification for structural rehabilitation, which uh, comes up a lot in rehabilitation jobs for uh, the MTO. <clears throat> So going through the highlights of the specifications in ACI 506, it goes through environmental conditions, 
making sure that you're between 10 and 28 degrees Celsius is in OPSS, uh, 931, whereas ACI has 5 degrees Celsius to 38 degrees Celsius for your substrate, as well as the ambient temperatures. Uh, surface preparation has to be clean, dust-free, uh, no water infiltrations, no um, concrete latents on it, uh, so sandblasting or water blasting has to be done to make sure the substrate is prepped properly. Reinforcement has to be as per the structural drawing, and in shotcrete it has to be extremely rigid. Uh, there isn't the availability for any vibration in the reinforcement as this will cause issues while placing the shotcrete. It really needs to be rigid to allow for the uh, velocity and compaction of the shotcrete, placing it. If it moves, you can get vibrations that cause shadowing behind the bar. I'll touch on the shotcrete mix components in a bit, but it's quite similar to, a, it's not quite similar to any normal concrete mix design. Uh, quality insurance, on-site, typical concrete testing is done, air, slump, um, and also shock replacement via test panel, depending on the project and pouring to see what the compressive strength is if cylinders aren't cast. Uh, shock feed application is either wet or dry mix and making sure that you're following the proper ACI standard uh, for placing it and finishing and curing on finishing. You can have a steel trowel, a sponge finish or gun finish or screed with a wood float. And curing is quite important. You can do use wet curing, burlap, uh, curing compound. Again, it depends on your project uh, conditions. <coughs> so going into the shotcrete specification on what's in the mix, um, for typical shotcrete mixes, it's a little bit higher for a 35 MPA type C1 foundation wall. We'd want between 420 to 450 kgs per cube and around 8% silica fume for workability and pumpability. Uh, water cement ratio uh, with a lower slump. We want to have a lower water cement ratio, maximum 0.5, typical uh, around 0.4 to maintain the high degree of plastic material cohesion to the substrate. Uh, the aggregate is the biggest difference uh, between conventional mixes. Shawcrete mixes re relatively have high volumes of sand, so 40 to 60 percent uh, more volume per shawcrete, and moderate volumes, of course, of 10 to 20 percent volume to volume of shawcrete. The coarse aggregate size is generally limited to 13 or 13.5 millimeters. Typically, the smaller stone uh, allows for uh, more compaction and less rebound, <clears throat> whereas on a conventional board wall, it'd be roughly 20 millimeter stone. Air and training bad mixtures, um, definitely added shock rate to improve pumpability, adhesion, uh, and also freeze-thaw durability. Again, these are all project-specific and can be made up prior to your project. Uh, because Shawcrete has a higher cement contact. It's sometimes um, subjective to higher shrinkage. Um, so fibers are sometimes introduced, either steel or synthetic, and there is some research going out for hemp fibers right now. Uh, this increases uh, toughness values, improve impact resistance and energy absorption as well of that uh, finely placed shawcrete. <clears throat> Accelerators are also added to improve placement uh, characteristics. If you're shooting uh, overhead, sometimes you need that accelerator to kick off the shotcrete to make sure that it sticks to the substrate, um, allowing for uh, thicker single pass applications and can also up your production on site. <clears throat> uh, additionally, when you're doing a rehab job, vibration uh, due to traffic or uh, transit rails uh, are sometimes an issue, so the accelerators allow the higher strength of the shotcrete to uh, get a good bond to that substrate. This is an example of a typical wet mix foundation wall uh, for a condo. It's got uh, 420 to 450 kgs per cube of cement contact content. We like to put slag in it for workability and also 8% typically of silica fume for pumpability. Uh, 
the coarse aggregate is roughly between 450 to 550 kg per cube, uh, and typically the maximum of 13 and a half millimeter stone. Fine aggregate is a lot higher than the coarse aggregate, as you can see, with a fineness modulus of 2.5, roughly uh, between 1150 and 1250 kgs per cube, and total water of uh, corrected for the sand moisture, which is very key, especially with our humid summers, between 155 to 165 kg per cubic meter. So, so these are just general guidelines when it comes to the mix design, but. Um it's still up to the concrete producer to give you the actual mix you're looking for and guarantee the performance. Correct. Correct. So like this is not a performance shockrete specification. These are just rough ideas of where the proportions are, uh, comparing them to a conventional uh, concrete uh, mix design. Again, using water reducer and air entering admixtures and a lower slump between 70, around 70 millimeters, uh, plus or minus 20. <clears throat> so now we're going to go through the advantages of using structural shockrete, um, focusing on blind wall applications, uh, structural liners, um, tanks, tunnels, and architectural shockrete, as well as in the dry mix shockrete with a focus of rehabilitation of existing structures with remote access, you know, mines, dams, working at heights anywhere uh, you can't get a ready mix truck in um, easily. So some of the advantages of using structural shockrete, uh, you're reducing the amount of cranes relating to concrete placement and delivery. Uh, you might not have to use uh, training in your mix or training in form work, uh, eliminating time, labor, materials related to former construction, erecting, stripping, and refinishing, anything. Uh, Increased daily production based on shooting um, segments per day and moving around a project um, in a linear fashion can save you scheduled savings. And depending on the mix in the project, you can get higher compressive strength, higher grade of finish, durability, and quality of work. Again, it's project specific, so it's, it's uh, definitely modifiable. Uh, additionally, there's approved resistance to waste washout and sulfide attack, uh, superior resistance to freeze-thaw cycling and salt scale resistance. Uh, uh, one key thing with shockrete is you can see what you're doing. Uh, you can review and verify the water condi uh, wall conditions, embeds, reinforcing steel, waterproofing, water stops and such, um, which is really good from the quality side of things until the concrete's finally placed. Um, on especially blind wall construction, you don't have that formwork in the way. And as well, for architectural finishing, you don't have to use any liners. You can hand tool everything on the wall. This is, uh, I don't like showing this photo, but this is a, a site that we were on. You know, everyone's seen this with formwork, you know, voiding happens. This is what I'm talking about in regards to the <clears throat> visual inspection. Uh, you can see when you're placing to make sure you don't have any voids in the actual wall while you're placing the shockrete. So moving on to some applications of shockrete. <clears throat> this is a uh, foundation wall that we shot in the past. On the left-hand side, you can see a curved wall for a ramp. And the right-hand side, you can see us placing uh, a 300 thick wall with a double mat, a 15M rebar, and finishing it with tool joints. Um, two of these projects were in Kitchener, one was in uh, Toronto. Retaining walls are also a good application for new construction in structural shawcrete. Um, once you get your rebar tied in place, you can see on the third picture there, Placing the list of the shawcrete, making sure you have good compaction, consolidation around the steel. And then finally, uh, depending on the finish that is architecturally done, tooling your cracks as well as putting uh, this one has a sponge finish and it kind of has a checkerboard pattern, uh, which is visually appealing. And the architect was very keen on it. <clears throat> uh, this actually is another architectural retaining wall. It's more common in the states where they shoot a retaining wall and finish it and tool it 
to make it look like natural stone. Uh, as you can see, it's very architecturally pleasing. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, infrastructure rehabilitation, so parking garages, uh, a lot of soffit repairs. Um, this example uh, on the right hand side, we were working on a high rise condo building, and above this uh, parking garage was a lot of plants and landscaping, and the owner didn't want to repair the uh, deck of the parking garage by ripping up all the land landscaping because the waterproofing had caused issues. Um, so we ended up going in there. There's roughly about 20,000 square feet of soffit. We chipped, surface prepped, and shot and finished uh, to rehabilitate the parking garage. Additionally, in tunnels and passageways ways uh, on the left hand side here, you can see the uh, rehabilitation of some patches. This is actually on the uh, Highway 62. Uh, and then on the right hand side, uh, you can see we're working actually in the Parliament buildings at West Block. We're spraying on the lining for pedestrian tunnels using wet mix shawcrete and accelerating. Uh, the shock feed at the nozzle uh, when it was going overhead to make sure that we had no fallouts. <clears throat> this is an example of another uh, smaller tunnel that we actually worked with CP rail and it was a dry mix application. As you can see on the left hand side, there was uh, large structural issues. Uh, this actually was supporting a railway bed uh, and it was in a remote location. So we went in there and rehabilitated this area off of a high tracker and didn't have the ability to use uh, wet mix due to access. So we were able to finish this project with, without disrupting the rail line for CP Rail, which is very important to them. <coughs> Again, on infrastructure rehabilitation, it's, it's been done on bridge work. This is actually an example of the Prince Edward uh, Viaduct in Toronto. We worked with uh, Toronto Zenith on this project and we had a very, very small working window. I was four hours on evenings on Sundays to perform this scope of work because the TTC rail was still active. Uh, so we saved uh, this overall project took about eight days of work and saved the uh, schedule for them immensely because we were able to rapidly place and repair all of these areas. And we used a dry mix shawcrete with an accelerator in it uh, for this project. Do the access, you can see on the left hand side where the orange tarp is, it was in the winter uh, or fall. So we had to heat and hoard the area to make sure we had the right ambient temperature uh, as well as substrate temperature. Some more examples of breeze bridge rehabs for um, Piers, abutments, columns, um, once the area is chipped and substrate is prepped, depending on uh, your environmental conditions, you can either use wet or dry mix um, and rehabilitate the uh, structure to give it better uh, structural capacity. <clears throat> um, more bridge work for um, reinforced concrete beams, this is actually on the Highway 400, uh, we went in on evenings to try and reduce the amount of shutdown of the road, rehabilitated with dry mix accelerated uh, shawcrete uh, to bring the bridge up to the rehabilitated state with the MTO. Moving on to more um, water type projects, you know, water reservoirs, canals, and spillways. Any Anytime there's shawcrete that's got uh, complex geometry, it's a little bit easier to use than conventional formwork as well as finishing it. Uh, on the left, you can see there was a dam that was partially refaced. In the middle is a spillway, and uh, on the right is another spillway that's gonna be uh, shot, prepped for shot, shawcrete. <clears throat> Uh, culverts, 
uh, we do a lot of rehabilitation of reinforced concrete uh, culverts as well as CSP culverts. There's uh, a lot of prep work that goes into it. The prep is the key, making sure your substrate <clears throat> is prepped properly and your rebar is adequately tied and your wiring is laid out to get the proper final thickness of shotcrete and coverage. Uh, this was a very tight access again using uh, dry mix and as you can see in the middle there the nozzle min is shooting overhead um, with an accelerated mix with very tight access and this ended up being a gun finish uh, to repair these areas. <clears throat> this is an example of a CSP culvert that got realigned after studs were welded and rebar was tied. We came in, shot and finished the invert uh, to extend the life of this culvert. You can see this is a wet mix application um, and it was quite fast and this mix was uh, brought out of a local uh, local ready mix uh, distributor and we did a bunch of test panels with them to make sure we dialed in the mix in the right proportions to make sure it was adequate for this project. More marine structures, again, uh, this is more in the States than it is in Canada, but uh, any wharfs uh, or walls that are against any salt water uh, sometimes it's easier instead of using foam work for any complex geometry to go ahead and shoot those areas. <coughs> uh, this is an example of a storage tank that we did at uh, Compass Mines down in Godrich. Uh, there's around 20,000 square feet of rehabilitation that occurred and it was key to the client that we don't disrupt any production of the mine. Uh, this work actually also occurred in the winter, um, so there was minimal shutdowns. Uh, the area, area had to be heated and hoarded as well. It, it worked out very well with the client. They were very happy that we didn't end up shutting down any of their production. Uh, it was also a dry mix uh, process with uh, no accelerator out in this one, but it had fibers in it to make sure that uh, the bond and the shrinkage was kept under wraps. <clears throat> Going back to more complex uh, geometry on the left hand side is shooting wet mix shotcrete for a silo uh, rehabilitation. Um, anytime you have any uh, issues with your silos, access is always tough and you don't want to shut down a plant. Uh, so you can go in there and prep the area and shoot it quickly without having to build custom formwork, as well as on dams on the right hand side. Again, Shockery has uh, the ability to be a bit more flexible and work from higher heights and holding the nozzle and shooting, as you can see, they're rebuilding that uh, curved dam structure. This is an example of a wastewater treatment plant in Barrie that we rehabilitated. Uh, this tank uh, was an anaerobic digester, so it was, had issues with microbial attack. Uh, so we went in and chipped and prepped the surface and we added an admixture to the shotcrete to fight against the microbial attack. Uh, and as you can see, we rehabilitated this uh, with a gun finish, and it was also dry mix shotcrete overhead and vertical. It can also be done in sewers. On the left hand side, they're rehabilitating a uh, brick sewer, uh, just meshing it and shooting it to make sure that you get your structural integrity. Up to spec. Uh, tunneling applications, uh, I think everyone is aware of what is going on on the Eglinton Transit project as well as in the Ottawa Confederation line using the North uh, New Austrian tunneling method that's with segments. Here we see some tunneling and mining methods. We're using four pole methodology. Uh, you know, shockery can be used for. Uh, both ground support as well as the final lining of the tunnel. Uh, in Ottawa, there was a lot of shotcrete shot to produce the final lining, that transition between the stations to the actual tunnel of the um, transit line. 
And right now they're getting ready to just start doing that work in uh, Eglinton. We're actually doing a couple of test panel shoots uh, next week with the contractors to take a look at that scope of work with wall thicknesses up to 1.3 meters, quite dense reinforcing. <clears throat> Uh, in our shoring division, we do a lot of uh, temporary shoring and soil nailing. As you can see, you, you can see the pins that are blue or orange to hold back the soil, and usually a fiber reinforced shock which is used to bridge between pins or mesh. Uh, it can be used for open cut. <clears throat> Here's another example of uh, ground support. This is actually rock protection at the uh, Woodward uh, Wastewater Treatment Plant in Hamilton. Uh, they're digging down the needed uh, rock support for the tank to be constructed. Uh, this project had over 30,000 square feet of rock protection shotcrete that was uh, accelerated at the nozzle. As you can see, there's water weeping through. This is only temporary um, while they construct it, but uh, there was a lot of water in the bedrock, so we had to install drainage strips and use an accelerator to uh, push the water towards the drainage strip to make sure that it would stick properly. This is another slope stability example at Credit River in Mississauga. Uh, during the rehabilitation of the bridge, uh, they needed a temporary access road that went underneath it to do rapid replacement of it. This project had about 30,000 square feet of shotcrete. Uh, it was a design, build, sole sourced work with the MTO um, to complete this project to build this access road. Uh, another example of some architectural shotcrete is a subway entrance. Um, you can see it's painted and looks, it looks quite nice, but the different contours and everything could not be done with formwork, but it's placed and cut by hand uh, with the finishing shotcrete crew. Additionally, it can be used in landscapes and zoos, cutting uh, rock features, ponds, and such. Uh, actually, the uh, mountain at Canada's Wonderland is actually shot with uh, dry mix shotcrete to get that uh, structure looking the way it does. Pools, water features, ponds, skate parks, all done with shotcrete. On the left hand side there, there's actually, that's actually Royal Botanical Gardens. We went in there and shotcrete and water, uh, waterproofed it with the material uh, to get the contours and complex shapes as well as skate parks on the right hand side. Uh, <clears throat> uh, finally, a lot of the loose tracks in uh, all of the Olympic Games are done with structural shotcrete. Uh, you know, they have a very complex mix design, and reinforcing detailing, and very, very high tolerances uh, to make sure that loose track is set up for the racers to go on. Uh, just referring back to a couple of the items I touched on. Uh, CSA 23.3 and 23.4 apply to shotcrete, OPSS 931 for structural rehabilitation, ECI 506 for the guide to structural shotcrete, uh, the American Shotcrete Association, also their shotcrete specifications and production, and a bunch of our HC MACON structural shotcrete uh, past projects. Now, uh, welcome to the floor for questions. Perfect. Let's have a look here. So first question, um, typically what kind of concrete testing is done on site? So on site, similar to any other concrete uh, project, uh, there's slump being tested, air being tested, uh, depending on the mix, as well as cylinders are cast to get compression. Uh, additionally, there's usually shockcrete panels that are to be shot and cored to, to also test for the compressive strength of that shockcrete material. Okay, perfect. Uh, we have some mixed design questions. Uh, supplementary cementing materials, what percentage uh, works best? Uh, again, this is uh, project specific. 10% uh, uh, slag is usually good for workability, but we have used up to 30%. Um, and we're testing in the upcoming week up to 70% uh, substitution with some sub test panels, um, as well as we want to use some silica fume for workability. Uh, to stay around 8%. Perfect. Um, just a follow-up question to that question. Uh, is silica fume actually required? It's not required, but it definitely helps with the workability, pumpability, 
uh, especially when you get long lines, uh, you know, up to 300 feet of line being pumped. Um, it definitely helps with uh, slicking the line. Okay. Uh, in the wet mix, is the 8% silica fume in addition to or included in the 420 to 450 kgs? That's included. That's okay. included. So that's total cementitious uh, materials. Okay. Uh, how far can you transport concrete to shoot wet shot creek through a two inch line? Um, well, typically it depends on the project. Uh, we've pumped up to 400 linear meters. Uh, again, it does go farther in a lot of mining uh, applications, but they put uh, retarders in the mix and put it to sleep and then accelerate at the nozzle right when they're at the uh, uh, work area so it doesn't get timed out. Oh, so you use a combination of the two? Yeah. Okay. And what line configuration and type works best for wet concrete, wet concrete transport? Uh, typically, you want to reduce the amount of rubber hose. Um, the longer amount of steel slick line you have, the better workability you're going to have and not going to have any issues with plugs or uh, when you're pumping. And you want to make sure you're reducing your line coming out of your line pump from a five to down to a four, three, two inch. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what, what drives decision making between wet and dry shockrete? Is it price, availability, <clears throat> or both? Um, I would say price and accessibility. Um, the biggest thing between wet and dry is production. Um, dry mix, you get a lot less production uh, compared to wet mix. And dry mix is, is usually advantageous when you have limited, limited uh, access. Okay. How do we make sure that rebars are encapsulated properly and what are the methods to confirm that they are? <clears throat> so to ensure the rebar is encapsulated properly, you have to make sure that you're using ACI uh, technique to ensure that you're uh, rotating your nozzle in a circular motion, always uh, shooting at a 90 degree angle. And the only way to check is doing coring, um, which is why we implement using ACI certified nozzlemen. So when they go through their two day test, both in the classroom as well as in the field, um, they shoot horizontal and overhead panels uh, and they get cored and they get looked at by an ACI examiner to, before they get their certification. Okay. So you mentioned the 1.3 meter thick uh, wall sections of the Eglinton LRT. Uh, what's the final purpose of it? Um, since this is the beginning stages of this, uh, these walls, it's more of a test. I'm not really going to go into details on that one there. We're just going to shoot mock-up panels. Okay. How do we make sure that rebars are encapsulated properly? I'll really have to answer that well, one. That's a similar question. Before. Yep. Uh, are GCs owners asking for conflicting performance in shockweed mixes like they sometimes do in normal concrete? For example, are they asking for higher green or SEM content? but want fast, fast, high strengths and the need to stick to walls, of course. So I think it's going back to the whole SCM question. Of, uh, yeah, I mean, on a typical um, condo building, no. Uh, on other projects, you know, it can be specified and it can be asked. You know, usually that doesn't really come from the owner. That might come from the engineer of record more if he's working with the owner uh, directly. And you would be working together with the concrete supplier, obviously, they have the Always, experience yeah, 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 yeah. of how much you know, to use. We would uh, roughly talk about a mix, um, if it's going to be tailored a little bit, and we would go through potentially trials at their yard uh, until we get it dialed in to the performance specifications that we want, and obviously do the testing for that to confirm it. Okay, perfect. Uh, curing, obviously very important. Uh, what curing <clears throat> methods work best for foundation walls? So same as concrete, always wet curing works best and with fogging and burlap. However, in the industry that isn't always uh, practical with the fast paced schedule. Um, so a lot of time curing compounds are used, making sure to do two coats both in the horizontal and vertical direction to cover the shock rate. Okay. And uh, what would you like to see the concrete industry work on to improve shock rate mix design performance? What is the next uh, generation shock rate mix? What would it look like? Uh, that's a fantastic question. Um, I think, you know, everyone 
learning uh, about the difference between concrete and shotcrete material, um, going in and really die and having the um, aggregates available for the coarse aggregate as well as the fine aggregate. I know this summer we battled with a lot of uh, fine aggregate having a little bit too much moisture in their mix, so they had to go ahead and uh, put the sand on a heating bed to try and correct the moisture for it. Um, it's, the mix is a little bit more volatile and has to be dialed in properly to make sure we get the proper application and quality product. Cool. Um, question about the tool joints. How do you ensure that they get placed straight? Uh, <laughs> lay, laying it out with a level. Uh, we typically use a six foot level um, or we pre lay out the tool joints on the wall, on the floor, as well as top of the wall. And you can string a line into it with your hand tool. Okay. Oh, this is a good one. Um, have you done any work on the gardener? <laughs> we have not. Uh, if you drive by the gardener, you can definitely see there's been uh, shock heat rehabilitation in the uh, past. Uh, but I think that was back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, we haven't done that recently. What, what challenges would you see with doing that type of work? With the amount of traffic, uh, I think it would be more of a coordination issue. Uh, with shock there's a lot of rebound, and you wouldn't want to end up getting uh, some rebound on people's cars when they drive by. Of course, yes. As well as uh, access for material when you're performing that work. Okay. I think that pretty much uh, answers all the questions. Um, thank you very much, Ryan. Thank uh, you for having me. In. Uh, great work. Um, and if there's any follow up questions, we can forward your contact information to the attendees, um, and they can reach out to you if they have any more questions. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of our next webinars, uh, October 23rd, we have uh, MTO specification updates webinar. We have Hannah Shell from the MTO coming in to uh, provide an update there. Uh, November 14th, we're going to be talking about, uh, again, concrete shoot secondary restraint methods. There's some big developments that have uh, happened in the last few weeks. Um, We'll have a presentation there. Season loads in, in December. Um, and then we have some consultants coming in in January to talk about MOE plant inspections, ECA issues, and um, anything you need to do to get ready for an MOE audit. Um, that pretty much concludes the webinar today. Thank you very much, everybody, again, for uh, tuning in. Thank you, Ryan, and uh, have a great day.